Hello, everybody. Hi. Hi. So this time I'm talking to a group of uh, grown-up young people. Very often I've given that talk at various schools to fourth graders. And of course, the, the way I present this story to fourth graders will be a little bit different than I'm presenting it to you. Somehow that reminds me of these three chairs being empty here. Uh, when I went to college, I remember a mathematics class where the professor uh, talked to us, and I sat right in front in the middle because I wanted to be, be able to see what he writes on the blackboard and not sit way in the back where I can't quite see everything he writes. He had the habit of looking straight at me for the entire lecture, talk to me, talk to me, talk to me, never looked around the rest of the class. I began to feel rather uncomfortable. You know, it's, you get hypnotized by that. <laughs> well, the class was over, I got a good grade, and it was the day after that I saw Dr. Johnson in the hallway, and I went over to him and said, Dr. Johnson, may I ask you a question? He looks at me, looks at me, haven't I seen you somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure pretty soon all of you, many of you, I hope, are going to be in college. And in college, you will learn science and history and literature, philosophy and wisdom. And when you finally, finally finish college, you think you know it all, and yet it's very little. It's like reading a newspaper, and yes, you know now what all the headlines are, but you really are not familiar with all the details. It takes a lifetime of experience to follow your career and follow your own thinking, and you're finally <coughs> a mature human being. And when you're all mature, and you know it all, well, it happens to all of us, we just die. Well, <clears throat> I was born in Germany in 1929. And when I was four years old, I didn't understand much about local politics at age four. You know. Hitler came to power. When I was six, Hitler was already in power for two years. Uh, I went to first grade in elementary school. The population was already thoroughly indoctrinated to hate Jews. The persecution took almost impossible proportions. Jews were beaten in the streets. Uh, Jewish storekeepers would have their windows smashed in. Uh, Jewish uh, teachers were fired from, from colleges. Jewish uh, professors were thrown out of the country. Jewish doctors were not allowed to, to practice any longer. Uh, night after night, the uh, German secret police, the Gestapo, how many of you are familiar with that name? Most of you. Came by people's houses and dragged mostly the men and sent them to concentration camps never to be seen again. I went to school every day, and the teacher very much encouraged the bullies in my class to harass me, to beat up on me. The uh, kids doing intermission of uh, doing, doing school uh, break would be in the, in the courtyards of the school. I never dared to go out there because they beat me up, so I stayed in the, in the you know, my chair in the back of the class and didn't, didn't dare to join the others to, to play in the yard. They would sing songs like, when the blood of the Jews drips from our knives, then we will be happy. And all the long Hitler youth kids walked around with their big knives on their side and felt very patriotic and proud of themselves. On the way home from school, I used to get uh, harassed and usually one or two of the kids finally provoked me sufficiently that a fight ensued. Once, every once in a while I got in a blow and, and uh, took, uh, took care of the guy who attacked me, but more often than not, I came home with a bloody nose. Until the day when uh, 
my parents were really very terribly concerned that my brother and I both went to German schools and we suffered terribly. He went to school and uh, talked to the teachers, of course they wouldn't talk to him anyway, and they said, uh, my father said, I'll be give him homeschooling, is that okay? And in Germany, that was against the law. He said, if you keep your kids at home for homeschooling, <coughs> you are breaking the law and you will go to concentration camp. So we were in an absolutely impossible situation. Uh, during the, just about every week or every other day, there would be parades in the street. And the Hitler youth and the, and the SS, that's the German black uniformed elite soldiers, would march through the streets with their military equipment, which was powerful indeed. And the sidewalks would be crowded from one end to the other with hundreds of thousands of people. Everybody jubilant. Flags would be in all the windows of the apartment houses around the avenues with swastika flags, window after window. It looked, it seemed, like every single German was a dedicated Nazi. Finally, finally, in 1938, it's about five years after all that started, we managed to get an exit visa from Germany, and my mother, my brother, and I took the train to Romania. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the European map in your minds? More or less all of you, good. Uh, I, at at one, some of the talks, I've taken the blackboard and put up a map in order to show where we got pushed around and how we had to flee from there and how the war went. Uh, unfortunately, in, in, they haven't got quite time I to do that. I can put yeah. um, a map on here. Oh, that would be nice. Yes. You, you can keep talking and I'll, yeah. I'll have the map that, up there in a minute. That would be great. Uh, my father stayed in Germany because he was promised and the uh, entry visa to the United States. When he came to, if he could come to the United States, he could then request his wife and children to come over too. Unfortunately, the ambassador in Berlin that the United States sent there was a pro-Hitler guy himself and would not allow any Jews to get entry visas into the United States. When my father heard that uh, went to the consulate and they told him that he's not going to get a visa. Went back out into the street to go back home to the city of Leipzig. Any, any of you know where Leipzig is? It's eastern Germany, okay? Not far from Dresden. And right next to Leipzig is a little town of Halle, a university, a university town. That's where I grew up. Somebody in the street told him, the Gestapo is looking for you in Leipzig. So he never went back home. He went to the border in Aachen, which is the border with France, and slipped across the border at night. He got stopped by a German border police. And at that moment, he said to himself, that's it, my life is over. Then the concentration camp was <coughs> killed. The German soldier looked at him, looked at his papers, and said, I haven't seen you. Go. That was Friday the 13th by the way. <laughs> well, father arrived in France, uh, where he illegally crossed the border, so he went into jail, but the Jewish community of Paris got him out the next day, and uh, not long after that, uh, uh, Germany attacked France, and you know, these are different stories. Won't go into that. In the meantime, we had gone to Romania, as I mentioned before, where my <coughs> grandfather, my mother's father, had a farm. That portion of Romania used to be part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And the Austro-Hungarian Empire was a live and let live kind of country. One of the reasons in the Austro-Hungarian Empire you didn't just have Austrians, or Hungarians, or Czechs, or Rutanians, or Hungarians, or Yugoslavians, or Bulgarians, or Jews, or Christians, or Muslims, it was really, it was almost like the United States. We were mixed. Consequently, in order to keep peace in the country, the Emperor of Austria uh, had the policy, live and let live. Let, let all communities get along with each other. And that worked for a long, long time, for hundreds of years. 
So, uh, but after the First World War, that section of Austria was yielded to Greater Romania. So here my, my grandfather became a Romanian citizen, didn't even speak Romanian. And while we got there, and it was a charming little town uh, with whitewashed houses and a nice river, the Seret River flowing through. If you look at the map, the Seret River comes from uh, the Carpathian Mountains and flows down into the Black Sea. And we were on that river, and my grandfather bought me a pony, and we, uh, we had the wonderful year. Uh, one, one little uh, anecdote I always tell about this little town of Seret was uh, I had that pony that followed me around like, like, like a dog. And I jumped under the pony one day and rode, we were slightly out of, out, outside the village. And I ran down into the village and my grandfather had given me a dime for ice cream and I stopped in front of the ice cream place and went in and had <coughs> some ice cream. You know, I left the horse outside, not even tied up there. You know, I knew he, that, that pony would stay there and wait for me. Well, I went in, had my ice cream, and all of a sudden I felt something pushing me in the back. The pony had come into the ice cream store. <laughs> Funny, what's going on here? Well, I had to push the pony back out, backward out, and turning over all sorts of tables in the process. <laughs> it was a number of years after the war that I had some visitors coming from Israel, and one of them was Mr. and Mr. Delfina, who used to own <coughs> the ice cream store in that village. And he wanted to know where that pony was. <laughs> <laughs> that was 40 years later, you know? <laughs> well, it was not long after <coughs> that that the Romanian king got kicked out of Romania, and his son Michael took over uh, the throne, who was, and he and his son Michael was an artist Nazi and converted the entire country to Nazism and Romania joined Germany uh, as one of the Axis allies. Now the Allies were, was really the Axis partners. We all knew, well at the time if you remember, <coughs> if you learned your history, the Germans had attacked Poland. And the Russians, in order not to have the Germans at their border, occupied the eastern half of Poland. Many of the Poles fled from Poland down into Romania. I remember them, wagon load after wagon, horses and buggies mostly, some cars that came across the border from Poland and went, uh, went through, uh, through our village. We also knew that an, an invasion of Germany into Russia was imminent even though the Germans had had a, con a, 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 a contract with the uh, Russians to uh, an agreement with the Russians, a non-aggression agreement. And we all knew that Germany is never going to keep that. In June 1941, the, uh, we saw the Romanian army going to the border, and our town was, was almost at the border with, with Russia. Uh, and that the Romanian army units came through our village. It was about the week before the war broke out, and we knew that an attack was imminent. The United States was utterly surprised when that attack came. All they had to do is call us in our village. We would have told them what's, what, what's coming. Well, sure enough, in June, the Germans attacked the Russians in Poland and advanced very rapidly because the Russians were not prepared for the massive panzer attack, that is the artillery attack that the Germans had. The Romanians were mostly on horseback. They still had World War I rifles, mostly and they had very, very few trucks, very, very little equipment, but they followed the German army and as the German army advanced, the Romanians would occupy the various villages and towns in the Ukraine and act as occupying force. About a month after that started, we were deported, uh, we were told in our village. And that happened, yeah. yeah. One morning my grandfather asked me, would you go into town and get the newspaper and get me a pack of cigarettes? <coughs> I jumped on my pony, dashed into town, bought a pack of cigarettes for grandpa, and got the local newspaper, and there was a square in town, 
and uh, the uh, there was a man in, very often standing in the middle of the square with a drum, and he would drum and drum, and people would collect around him, and he would distribute some new ordinances or special news that came about. People didn't have radios. And I heard this guy drum, uh, beating his drum, so I walked over. At the time I was 12 years old. Uh, the uh, drama said, this town uh, of about uh, 3,000 people had about 2,000 Jewish Jews living there, about uh, six, seven other Jewish families. All Jews must come down to the square, assemble at the square at uh, 8 in the morning with no more than 20 pounds on their backs. And you will be marched out of town and you will be sent to be recolonized somewhere else. But we knew what that recolonization meant. Anybody who fails to join the group to be marched out of town will be summarily shot. I ran home and gave the news to my grandparents and my mother and, and uncles over there. Everybody was shocked. They ran at the time. They wanted to find out whether it was true indeed. The next morning, we had no choice but to put a pound back. We all assembled at a marketplace in town and we got marched out. Now, it turned out that um, some people simply could not join that, like old people that were bedridden. They couldn't possibly march out of town. And surely, surely, somebody has to stay with an old person like that to take care of them. And the local police, uh, you know, it was a small town. We all knew each other. We knew the neighbors. We knew the Romanian neighbors and, and uh, originally German colonists that lived in that town. We all knew each other. We, we, we were friends. We played cards together. We children played together. Surely the police will understand that some of these old people could not be left alone. The next day, the local police went around town and found a dozen or more older people bedridden. They brought a, a, along a horse and buggy. They loaded all the sick people into the buggy. All the younger folks who were stayed behind to take care of the old people walked behind the the cart, and they drove the uh, in the park went down, marched down to the local cemetery. The cemetery, the young people were told to dig a deep hole. They did. And when the hole was dug, they shot all the old people into it, followed by sh shooting all the younger ones along with them. And so about 30 or 40 people got shot into that mass grave. We didn't know about that until later. The, the, uh, it was not exactly advertised through the country that that's what happened. In the meantime, we were <coughs> marched 12 miles out to the nearest railroad station. And, you know, as a 12-year-old, I did not realize the seriousness of all that. I thought it was kind of like a big camping trip, you know. I'm having fun. And we marched out to the railroad station and we got put into cattle cars. By the way, am I talking loud enough? Slow enough? Mm -hmm. You don't want to hear me? Okay. I have, a, I have a little microphone, but are you guys good? Yes, ma'am. You know, I used to teach classes in colleges but that were bigger than this and uh, never really needed the microphone. My wife always tells me to, to speak a little less loud. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, for years of teaching, you know, I, I, uh, you develop uh, a kind of the knack for it. Well, we got put into these cattle cars 80, 90 people in a relatively small cattle car. There wasn't even room to, to sit down. We all were pushed like, like a New York subway train in rush hour. And the doors were shut and locked. And there we stood for a couple of days without food, without water, without toilet facilities. It was the summer of 1941. It was hotter than blazes, 100 degrees. That part of Europe gets very hot in <coughs> the summertime. They are far away from the ocean and it gets very hot in the summer. Older people collapsed, died. 
that people had to relieve themselves right under their feet. And we stood there hungry, thirsty in that stink. It was unbearable, unbearable. Eventually the train started to move. And we were 12 days in the train, taking us to southern Romania. Halfway down through that trip, the train stopped at the, uh, some station, and uh, milit Romanian military trains went by on us on the next track, throwing stones at us and uh, hurling insults at us. And But at least our doors were open. We could get out and get some water at the, uh, the nearest well, under, with Romanian guards, of course, standing with their rifles guarding us, and clean out our, uh, our carts, uh, railroad cars, a little bit. And then we got back locked in again and went for the next five or six days to southern Romania, where we got put in a camp. We were in that camp only about two or three months, and it wasn't too terribly bad. We had an old school building where we could spread out on, and, and there was a local Jewish community in the, in the city of Craiova, which is southern Romania, who managed to get food into, the, into that camp. So it wasn't all that terribly bad. But three months later, the, uh, we were allowed to return back home. We were absolutely delighted. And we had to uh, get a train. We had to pay a lot of money to get a, a cattle car train to take the whole town back to northern Romania of the little town of Seret. This time it didn't take 12 days, it took only four days. And it wasn't that terribly hot, it was fall. So it, that was not, nothing much terrible to remember about. We got back, we got off the train, and we wanted to march back the 12 miles into town, and we got stopped by the police. They did not want us to come. The local population, Romanians, Germans, Rotanians, did not want us to come back into town. For one thing, they were somewhat embarrassed about the story of the people that got shot into the graves. For another, they had plundered our homes. Whatever was in the homes, linen, furniture, silverware, carpets, you name it, it was all, all taken, <coughs> plundered, and given to the lo local non-Jewish population. So they didn't want us back. So they stopped us, and they marched us <coughs> to the next town over, where we found where we, where we found temporary quarters. Well, that lasted about a couple of months, and another order came through with a drummer standing in the middle of the square of the of the little town of Radauti, saying the same thing that the drummer said two months earlier, th three months earlier in Seret. All have to assemble at the railroad station at uh, mid-afternoon with no more than 20 pounds on their back, and we get recolonized. This time, I knew it wasn't a camping trip. I knew the hardships of it. So I lifted my face to the heavens and said, oh God, please, please, not again, not again. Didn't help. We assembled the next uh, morning at the, that railroad station we got put crammed into the cattle cars just like last time, except this time it was October and not June. It was cold and wet and raining. And the doors got locked like last time, and this time the train rolled north. The Germans and the Romanians had occupied the better part of the Ukraine, all the way up to Odessa, all the way up to uh, Stalingrad, Smolensk, Moscow, St. Petersburg, the Germans had advanced deep into Russia. And they had set up concentration camps all over the place where the plan was to ship all those Jews to Poland and to the Ukraine and kill them all. And indeed, after the war, six million Jews got exterminated. Some survived. I was one of the few that survived. We uh, got to the after four days in that cattle car, only about 300 miles north, the train went very slow. It was pouring rain. We came to the Niester River. Is that map 
Here is Germany, where I come from. Here is Romania, where my grandfather had a farm near the Russian border, near the Ukrainian border. And we went from Romania up into the Ukraine. And, yes, and the Dniester River flows right around here. Our train came to that Dniester River. Gives at least a, a, an idea as to as to where. And, and from here to there is about 1,500 miles. Okay. Yes, and that's all again. I like to see the faces of the students I talk to. We uh, got uh, disembarked from the train because the bridge over that river was had been blown by bombardments. And I was a 10 or 20 acre open field, <coughs> nothing but mud, deep in the mud. And our train unloaded. After we unloaded, the empty train left, and another train came in, and then another train came in. By the time the evening rolled around, there must have been at least 50 or 60,000 people squ uh, squished together on that, on that acre of mud that we were sitting there. Romanian guards were standing around us. Anybody that made the wrong, wrong move, of course, got shot. For some reason, I don't know where my grandparents had, we had some sort of a blanket out of uh, cow skin blanket, or what it was. And we spread that out and were able at least to kind of sit on it. And next to us was an, uh, another family also sitting down in the mud. And he happened to have been the local pharmacist from the city of Radauti. And my grandfather told me, we absolutely need some water. We are dying of thirst. and we, we, we must have some water. But there was a creek flowing nearby. And somehow or other, they sent me with a bucket to go to that creek and get some water. But I had to work my way through the Romanian gendarmes who were guarding the, the periphery of that field. If they, if they see me, they would either beat me or shoot me. Well, I managed to wait until they looked the other way and slipped down to the river and got a bucket of water. And I managed to get back up again without being seen. I made it back to our location with a bucket of water. The pharmacist came over and says, can I please have a, a little bit of water for my family? He said, of course. Well, we bedded down on that thing the best we could, uh, sitting or leaning against each other, and we spent the night. When the sun rose the next morning, or the sun light came up, it was still snowing or raining, the pharmacist and his wife and his three children had committed suicide. They knew what they were getting into, and they, they didn't want any part of it. Three days in that muddy field, finally we got the, we had to form a column and got marched into a little town called Ataki. Nothing to do with attacks, but the name was Ataki. If you uh, are home and you look at your uh, map on the internet, maybe you can even locate that little town. It's a very small town, it may not be on there, on the Niesta River. If you look at the city of Chernovitz, that would be on your map, and you just draw a line north to Niesta River, that's about where we were. Uh, we got marched to that little town of Ataki, and the bridges over the river, of course, were blown. So they uh, told us to make ourselves uh, at home in the town of Ataki. The town was fairly empty. Uh, the inhabitants of the town had been mostly Jews. And when the Romanians came through that area, they summarily killed everybody. Well. Uh, we found an old school building with busted windows and a leaky roof and what have you, but we moved in there and at least we had a fairly dry place to lie down on. There was a courtyard, this school building, and there were some outhouses in that building, and we used it, but, you know, thousands of people after a day or so, the thing became unusable, and people did what they had to do in the courtyard in one corner. If, uh, pretty soon the entire courtyard was filled with nothing but layers of feces. Four days later about, we got the new order that there are uh, ferries that will take us across the river to the town of Mogilev. 
And that you can find on the map. That's a, a larger town, Mogilev Podolsk. There are two Mogilevs in Russia. This is a southern Mogilev called Mogilev Podolsk. And we got taken away from that, uh, marched out of that school building and, and marched down to the river. About half a mile down towards the river, a Romanian soldier grabbed me by the collar and pulled me out of the column. He also grabbed half a dozen other kids out of that column, all, all 12, 14, 15 year old kids. And they marched us back to the uh, schoolyard where we were and told us to clean up that yard. We had no tools, no spades. We had to clean it up or we'd be shot. Well, we did. I don't think I have to describe to you the uh, disgusted, uh, disgusting chores that we had to go through. We cleaned it up. And when we were all done, we were marched back down to the river and where the multitude of 100,000 people along the edge of the river, we got let loose. Romanian gendarmes uh, circled the entire uh, river area. We, uh, we were kind of locked in there but I didn't know where my family was. How do I find my family among 100,000 people on the river? And for who knows, they may have already been shipped across the river, and I'll never find them again. I ran along and ran along, and I didn't see any familiar faces until after about a half hour running around, I saw a face that I knew. Stopped and said, have you seen my grandfather, Mr. Hönigsberg? He was a well-known man. Yes, he said, I've seen about an hour ago, about a little bit further down the river bank. You find him there. And indeed, I did. But that was a relief, I tell you. We got shipped across the river to the little town of Mogilev. And there again, we got put into some old, beaten, run-down, bombed-out school buildings, where we stayed again for a week. I don't know where we got any food from. We didn't have anything to eat. Somehow or other, uh, people managed to scrounge things, but I don't know where. And we had a few, few little bites to eat, not much. And then we assembled from our little town, uh, we, uh, San Seret, we, we had seven families of us banded together and said, if we work as a team, we may have a chance of survival. If we all work just for ourselves, we surely will perish. So seven families got together. We will share food, we will share work, we will share whatever needs to be done, work the job has, we will do it together. Uh, among them was a little guy, I don't know whether he was under five feet. And he weighed about, I don't know, maybe exaggerating, three or four pounds, he, he, he was that big. He couldn't, e Lonio Abraham was his name, he couldn't even walk down the street without the weight pulling him down forward or backward. He was, however, extremely bright. His eyes, when he looked at you, were like steel. When he said something, everybody did what Lonio wanted. He organized us, and he managed to speak to some Romanian uh, officers, because we were under Romanian guards, there were some Germans there too, but mostly Romanian guards, and told them that if we uh, can stay in this town rather than being shipped further d down in forced death marches to the Ukraine, we will set up a little black market or something and they'll profit by it. Well, you couldn't do that with Germans. Germans are strict. They do only what is the law. Everything has to work just right. If uh, Hitler said, kill the Jews, they kill the Jews. That's the law. The Romanians are more flexible. They are also cruel and they are vulgar and they are brutal, but they are not as organized as the Germans were. So we managed to stay in the town of Mogilev, where most of the other people got marched into forced marches hundreds of miles into, into the Ukraine. Half of them died on the road. Uh, my, I, after the war, I heard that my grandmother's sister, a woman in her 70s in those days, and her husband, uncle, uncle of mine, they, got, they couldn't face the march. And the uncle, my granduncle, somebody told us, sat down in the ditch 
a soldier came over and bayoneted him to death. My aunt, I was told, kept on walking for another few miles and she collapsed in the same, and she suffered the same fate. And so did many others. So we stayed in the little town of Mogila. That was good. And we finally, uh, that same man, Lonyu, found an old Russian school building where it, where it was empty. It was partially bombed out, but still you could make yourself comfortable in it somehow. We moved in, and uh, in a room about half this size, or even less than half this size, we were 20 people. And there were two other rooms next to other classrooms next to where we had the rest of the the uh, seven families uh, uh, boarding in. So at least for the moment, we were settled. Whatever comes, comes. The first year was the hardest. Uh, we didn't have any heat. The Russian winters are ferociously cold. Uh, we bundled ourselves up the best we could. That classroom had a little stove in it, old Russian stove but we didn't have anything to burn in it. But I got sent out to see where I see any torn down buildings that I could rip some wood off and steal it back after sun, sunset and bring it so we can make a little fire in the in, in little pot belly. We did. People that were outside and couldn't find any place to move into all froze to death in the streets. Some of them died first because of lack of food and famine. Others died because of the cold. And eventually, after a few weeks, diseases began to break out. Cholera, typhoid fever, typhus fever. This that comes that. from a bite of a louse. We tried to keep ourselves clean, but we had no soap. We had no water. We deloused our, our shirts in the evening as best we could. And if, God forbid, you get bitten by a louse, chances are Within one week, you'll run a fever. Within a few more days, the fever goes up to, to uh, very high, I think. To, uh, in, in centigrade, I remember, it was 45. It's about 104 degrees or so, 105 degrees. At that, at that temperature, the brain burns up. People go amok, and uh, they have to be put down. And, and, uh, and usually, after a few hours, they just collapse and die. So many of us in that first winter never, never made it through. Half the population just as well died. We did have an outhouse in that place. It was a schoolyard. It had an outhouse with about six or eight holes where people could, for men on one side and for women on the other side. And uh, it had to be cleaned. I got myself a reputation of being a toilet cleaner. <laughs> so I got assigned to keep the toilets clean. I did. I think I did a pretty good job. But feces is the one place where you can catch the typhoid uh, bacteria. And I did. And after a few weeks, I came down with a high fever. I felt by that time I was not 13 ye years yet. My head almost came apart from, from headache. And I lied down. We had a doctor in, in camp, but of course the doctors had no medicines or anything. He came by, Dr. Goldman, and he looked at me and he, I saw him shaking his head to my mother and saying, the kid has to be transported to what's called the local hospital, otherwise everybody else is going to get it in this room. It turns out that the the, the 18 people that lived, the 18 people, in that particular room, uh, they, li they liked me very much. I was a little boy, I was cooperative, and I did a lot of chores, and they said, <coughs> and had, they knew if I get transported to that little hospital, I'm dead in a couple of days. If they keep me here, there's a chance of survival. So I got put into a corner with a Nobody could come closer to me than two or three feet. Only my mother could come over and give me some water to drink. And they said, if little Fred dies, we all go with him. That's OK. He'll have to die anyway. We won't send him to the death chambers. So I stayed. It was a secret. Uh, 
The typhoid fever is a kind of thing where it's called, it has another name to it. Typhoid fever is called hunger typhus. Because you get terribly hungry. The hunger pains become unbearable. And yet, the doctor said, if I get any food to eat, it will kill me. Food is poison. All I can possibly get is a quarter of a potato a day, if you can get a potato somewhere. Somehow or other, uh, my mother managed to get uh, two or three potatoes from somewhere, which could keep me alive for the next week or two. I did nothing but hallucinating about food. I didn't care whether I died the next day or not. I just wanted something to eat, I wanted something to eat. I didn't get it. The uh, crisis of that particular typhoid fever takes a long time, takes almost three weeks. So the third week, typically the fever shoots up to a very high temperature and typically ends in death. When that day came, my grandfather was sitting three feet away from me in some little stool, singing Hebrew prayers all night for the Lord to save my life. I could hear him, but I only hallucinated about food. And somehow or other, I did not die that night, obviously. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. I woke up the next morning, and the fever had broken, and there was a chance of recovery. Uh, it took another week or two before I could even stand on my feet. And then, slowly, slowly recover. Uh, in camp itself, uh, there was an iron factory, oops, an iron factory where my brother found work for the Romanian army. And he was, his payment was uh, maybe a quarter a day uh, plus three slices of bread. But he, he brought back the three slices of bread. So we each had a quarter of a slice of bread to eat every once in a while. <clears throat> so the next two years, I'm uh, running out in the next 10 minutes, so let me make a brief. We, uh, the, the two years to follow were, uh, went in that same vein. We got a little bit more to eat because we did open up that little black market that we promised the Romanians. We got a little bit more food in into ourselves. We managed to get some, some more wood from places to keep ourselves warm. <coughs> and we managed to, with the, uh, uh, managed to get some fat from some cattle to make our own soap to keep ourselves a little cleaner. And pretty soon life got to be just a little easier. Then also the word came around that the Germans had been beaten at Stalingrad and they are retreating. And the Romanians knew darn well that if they lose the war, they'd have to pay the price for what they did. So the, uh, it got, they, they eased up on us a little bit. Sure enough, one morning I got up, I was already in fairly good shape, and I ran out to get a bucket of water from the well. And uh, I heard some thundering. And I looked at the sky and it was clear. It was a month, it was in March. Pretty cold still there in March. I called out my, my grandfather, and we all lived together, German men, old and young. In, among the Germans, they couldn't do that. Uh, Grandpa, do you hear what I hear? He listened, he says, yes. I remember from World War I. That's artillery. So the Russians are close by. Same time, we got word that uh, German SS troops are going from camp to camp to exterminate those people that had survived. And we said, at this last minute, we will, not, we will fight. And uh, when we heard that the Gestapo was real near and about to come into our town to wipe us out, that school building had a cellar down below. And we all hid down in that cellar with a trapdoor in it. And by, it was about two in the morning that we heard somebody opening that trapdoor and coming down. And we definitely thought these are German Gestapo looking for Jews to exterminate us. And we have only a few more minutes to live. And my grandfather and an uncle of mine stood at the bottom of the steps with clubs in their hand, maybe to knock them out, take away their guns, do something. 
three quarters of the way down the steps, all of a sudden a flashlight came on and shone into our faces. And suddenly a voice behind that flashlight said, in Yiddish, which is the language that many of the Jews, it's kind of a German dialect that the Jews spoke in Eastern Europe. God, he said, these are our people. And it turned out that he was a Russian soldier, a Jewish Russian soldier, in the advanced uh, reconnaissance group. And he was with one or two soldiers with him. And uh, so we knew we were saved. He put his machine gun down, came down, there was a lot of embracing. <coughs> you know, we were one minute from being executed, and, and here we are saved. That relief is unbelievable. Well, after all that uh, hugging was over, he said, the Russian tanks are going to come through in the morning, and they need gasoline. And right next to us here is a railroad station where the Germans left tank cars filled with gas. We got to go over and empty out those, in, 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 empty some gasoline from the tank cars into barrels, roll vans down the street. When the tanks come through town, we can load them onto the tanks so they can pursue the Germans. Well, we all agreed, of course, to go. At that time, I was already uh, 15. <laughs> Three years had come by. And we ran over to the uh, railroad station and had a long hose into some barrels. And they gave me a lantern to hold so that the, can do, uh, the, the, kid, the people can do what, uh, what they had to do. And uh, I had the lamp, and it was a bit windy. And the spark from my lamp went over to the hose. The hose had been a catch fire. And the Russian guy said, just run, run as fast as you can. And I ran as fast as I threw myself into a ditch 20 feet further down, and the whole car went up in flames, exploded. After it burnt itself out, half hour later, he said, well, there are a whole bunch of other car, uh, railroad cars here with gasoline. And he said, the, you can use a lamp. But this time, stand five feet further back, would you please? <laughs> <laughs> well, I did. And we, we uh, loaded up barrel after barrel of gasoline, rolled it up in the streets. In the morning when the tanks came, we had to load it up. Uh, After this was all over, we, uh, the Russians occupied the town. Uh, the streets were full of dead Germans, dead horses. It was a mess after the battle. Airplanes flew overhead. Grenades, were, artillery shots were firing from all over the place. And, uh, but at least we knew the Germans were gone. Uh, about three months after that, I managed to get on a Russian military train and uh, hitchhiked my way back into Romania. And from there, well, uh, we, uh, I stayed two more years in Romania and went back to high school in Romania. And I was finished with, almost finished with high school when there was an opportunity for my mother and me. We found our father through the Red Cross in France. And he found us also through the Red Cross. We were alive. We were one of the few lucky families who were alive. So my mother and I picked ourselves up in Romania and we walked to France. We started in October, we got there in January. One funny thing was that I'll tell you still about is on that way to France, I got caught at various borders with my mother and wound up in jails. And uh, fortunately, uh, we managed out, uh, to wiggle ourselves out of those jails. If the, if, if we hadn't done that, if we hadn't managed to get out of those jails, the Russians would have sent us to forced labor camps in Siberia. But we managed to get out, and we, and we got to France. In France, I went back to high school. After that, I got an entry visa to the United States. In 1950, I came to the United States, and I got an engineering degree from Stanford University. And uh, I got the job at the research labs, uh, at uh, the Lockheed Martin Research Labs, as well as Stanford University. And CIA people <coughs> came by to, for me to get secret clearance. And they asked me, have you ever been jailed? I said, yes. He said, oh my god, how can we give secret clearance to a person that was in jail? Who jailed? What happened? 
I said, oh, the Russians jailed me, sir. Oh, the Russians jailed you. You get your clearance tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, at that point, uh, uh, there are lots and lots more details I could tell you about, but we're running out of time. Well, Any uh, questions? We can go another hour. Okay. We can go. If yeah. anyone needs to leave and go to the other class, they can go. But these kids have permission yes. to stay a little longer. If you're, if you're willing to. Yeah, if you yeah, want to I'm stay fine. a little longer, I think, I does, do you all have questions? Does anybody want to ask any questions or anything? Yeah. Um, did you need to go then, Chris? I mean, the, 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 the family that, that when, when, you, when you first came into the camp and the family was right next to you, after they committed suicide, it was a whole having to be having to be made for them, like for the great, for the greatest, because I've, I've heard that whenever a person dies in the camps, they have, they have to make holes. And had to and had to be and had to make them as a, as a grave, even though they've been there to write in. But they, but was there like a hole? Like did they bury? Yeah. What did they do with the body? Well, every morning, uh, pe pe lots of people died every night, and they were collected along the streets, along the burnt out buildings, and just thrown on a horse and buggy. And sometimes you could see uh, 20, 30, 40 bodies piled up, his arms and legs hanging down from the car carried out of town and thrown into a mass grave. Any other questions? Yeah. Why did they put you in jail when you were trying to Crossing borders illegally. You from Romania to Hungary, from Hungary to Austria, from Austria to Germany, from Germany to France, and I'm down the line. I got caught a couple of times. Yeah. Have you, have you been back? I've been back to Romania once. It was under communist uh, rule. And... Uh, that in itself is, is a, <laughs> a long story. But uh, I was not afraid of him. As a matter of fact, I went back to Romania with my brother, who also survived, who still lives in Germany today. He's a writer. He's a well, well-known writer in Germany. He and I went back to Romania to see my grandfather's old farm. Of course, it was nationalized by the Russians. <coughs> but the uh, farm itself, was still in good shape. The entire street had burned down, yet my grandfather's house was somehow still standing. Yeah, we went back. It was under Ceausescu, the Romanian communist leader, that uh, finally he got, he got killed by the Romanians a couple of years after, later than that. And does the majority of your family still live in Europe or the United uh, States? My brother lives in Europe. Oh, we had, I lost a lot of members. My father lived in France. My parents died a few years ago, but not in camp. And we lost, I would say, about uh, 50, 60 percent of our family. Some of them escaped to South America. Some of them, before the war broke out, managed to get to the United States. And some of them went down to Africa. And uh, a few of them survived the concentration camps. And the rest of them got all killed. We had a family of probably a uh, hundred uh, aunts and uncles and cousins and grandparents and what have you. Uh, a few of them survived, most of them got killed. So how many people do you know personally that survived? We got invited back to Germany in 1998. The city of Halle invited us to come back and uh, treated us royally. Um, the mayor of the town, Dr. Rausch, spent every day with <coughs> us, at least half a day with us. They had wonderful accommodations for us, wonderful food for us, everything the town paid for. They, we made the joke when we, when we got there that uh, a few years ago, the Germans couldn't do enough to kill us all. Now they are going to try and kill us with all the food they put on the table. <laughs> <laughs> German cheeses and herrings, and you name it. Uh, I did not tr obviously trust the Germans, but they were so nice that eventually you break down and you say, you know, those people really are sorry what happened. So there's no resentment? There is. It's mixed. Uh, you can't ever, you can forgive, but you can't really forget. Uh, that mayor himself uh, told us a story that when he was a little boy, he uh, lived in uh, Western Germany. And uh, in an apartment house, where they lived on the second floor, <coughs> and uh, he was the only child. And his parents very often went out in the evening, it was under Hitler, 
and upstairs, a, a uh, flight above them lived the Jewish family. And his uh, parents used to bring the kid up to the aunt and uncle that lived upstairs, and they went out for the evening to a movie, playing cards, whatever. And when he came home, they picked him up again. And he loved to go to his auntie and uncle upstairs because they gave him chocolate and spoiled him. One evening, he was in there, and the door got run down by uh, the uh, German uh, SA, that's the Sturmabteilung. They came in and uh, began to rough up the old couple that lived there, threw the, the piano out the window, and beat the two old people and dragged them out of, of the house, and they're never seen again. The kids saw it all. They knew he was a, a German kid, so, so a German Christian kid, so they left him sit there in the corner. When the parents came home, they found him sitting shocked on the floor. And well, you know, kids forget. Uh, everything is survivable. But after the war, he reminded himself what really happened. And he wanted to know whether his auntie and uncle are still alive or not. So uh, one way to find out is to go to Israel and see whether he can locate them there. But they were not in Germany anymore. He and several friends went to Israel after that. And uh, they got very nicely treated. And they, some families in the city of Haifa invited these German students. At that time, he was a German student to dinner. When they came into their house, it didn't look like an, an Arab place. It looked like a German place. A cuckoo clock, oriental rugs, books on the wall. It was furnished just like an apartment in Berlin. And he asked himself, <coughs> these people, they were doctors and lawyers and professors and competent people. They, they never harmed anybody. Why did the Germans so viciously lash out against the Jews? Uh, and he told us, he told us, told us that story. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, if the German hadn't lashed out against the Jews, Einstein would have stayed in Germany. Fermi would have stayed in Italy. Uh, all the uh, scientists, and many of them were famous Jewish physicists, they might have gotten the atomic bomb before we ever did. So to some extent, <laughs> It turned out all right in the end. Questions? Yes? How did you find Arkansas? Ah, oh, yeah. <laughs> we got to Arkansas. Uh, you know, um, Americans know the West Coast and the East Coast. And California, I lived in California, in, in San, San Francisco area. It was got crowded. It got expensive. It got anxiety ridden. And, we, and I said, gee, when I retire, and I was already 70 when I retired, I really don't want to stay in California. It's beautiful climate and gorgeous countryside, but it's too crowded. Where can I go to a place that nobody's ever heard of? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody said, Arkansas. That's why we are here. <laughs> and never regretted it. <clears throat> had a question that I had answered yet. What did, you, what did you do in that black market? What was it? Okay. We managed... Uh, to uh, bribe the uh, local police to allow some Russian farmers to send some cattle across the river that we slaughtered in the bottom of uh, our, in our cellar. And then divided it all up. The soap we used, the, uh, the grease we used, we used to make soap, and the meat we distributed throughout as much as we could. And I was usually the one that carried little packages to various people in that camp so they have something to eat. At one point I got caught by a Romanian soldier. And uh, he wanted to know where I got it from. And I knew if I told him where I got it from, my whole family would be executed. So I said, uh, a Ukrainian peasant uh, gave it to me at the uh, edge of the camp through, through the barbed wire. But he didn't believe me. He pulled his rifle up, stood me up against the wall, and said, I've killed many Jews. One more doesn't matter. Tell me or I'll shoot you. And he cocked his rifle, and I closed my eyes. He counted one, two. and the count of three, I felt a big blow on my head. And for that instant, I knew I was shot. It turns out that he turned his gun around and hit me with the back of the gun over the head and left. I woke up about three or four hours later 
and uh, still have a pretty big <laughs> boil on my head there, and made it back. And my uh, grandfather and mother didn't know where I was, they were sure relieved when I showed up again. That was a black market that we did. And many other little things. They allowed some flour to come in, uh, some potatoes to come in, and it was all uh, ten times the price, but uh, let me, I answered you at the back. How did you bribe them? Well, with the black market, there was uh, a German currency, German occupation marks that we were allowed to use. There was a factory in town where my brother worked, and they paid him like one or two marks a day to work in that factory. Not that you could do much with it, but that was available. And once the money was legal to have there, people managed to get more of it and give it to the Romanian soldiers. And yeah, I was a kid at the time. I, I, I didn't figure out all the details. <laughs> you have another question? Yeah, sir. Um, and, and I can't, because my, my mom's been in the DECA, because she grew up in Germany or something, but she, she's not in Germany, but she grew up in there. Uh, and she went to the camp back out, and um, was, was there any ovens, like, was there any, like, bunk beds, like, you know, like, I don't, I don't know if you've seen back out, but there's, there was, like, bunk, there was, like, bunk beds, and there was ovens, was there any, in the camps, like, that, 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 that was, that was, that was there for you, or, or, or was there, or was there a lot less ovens and, uh, beds and stuff like that? Yeah, well, I mean, you talk about ovens, uh, I'm thinking of the crematoriums in yeah, uh, of the Germans, yeah. Yeah. where the people first got gassed and then got thrown in the ovens. No, in the Romanian camps we didn't have that. Uh, we had uh, bunk beds, well, no, but it was a school building and there were school tables and and uh, we found some boards to lay across these uh, school tables and that's where we managed to lie down on and sleep. Any more questions? Yeah. How were you treated when you came to the U.S., when people knew what you had came from? Well, you know, in the U.S., of course, I got treated right. I still have a, have a regular entry visa and, and presented that and uh, immediately applied for citizenship. And I got a job in New York City for $27 a week. Uh, well, $27 in those days was like $300 today, you know. And, but I, I lived on it uh, enough. Lived in a uh, tiny little room uh, that was uh, uh, four feet by six feet long. Just the bed was in there and a the chair. It was, it was all I could have in that room. And uh, I had some family in New York City, and they invited me over for for dinners once a week. And I managed to register at the City University of New York. And at the City University, they were, they asked me what schools I've had. I said, I went partially to Romanian high school, then I, then I went to French high school. And well, he said, in order to matriculate for American colleges, you have to, you have to be matriculated, and we don't know what to do with you. So they sent me around to various professors. Here I have a little side story. In that camp where we were in, 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 uh, in Mogilev, in the Ukraine, lived with us in the same room, a man who, who was a high school professor, mind you, a, te a teacher in high school, not teachers, yeah, professors. And Herr Professor, Frau Professor, boy, they were, when the professor stood on the sidewalk, the students made room on the sidewalk for him, a much more respectful environment for professors than, than we have here in the United States. And uh, he spoke a little Russian, and we went down in the cellar of that building and we found textbooks in Russian. And he picked up some books of physics and chemistry and mathematics. And in the evening, when, when we, uh, we didn't know whether we'd survive, but if we could dis distract ourselves uh, with some uh, ma mathematics problems, that might help. So he taught me arithmetic, he taught me algebra, he taught me integral calculus, he taught me differential equations. He taught me physics. By the time I came out from that camp at age 15, I had as much science knowledge as, uh, as normally kids have after two years of college. So when the professors at the uh, at New York schools uh, examined me, they said, we don't know what to do with you. You know it all. <laughs> well, I did, but I said, it doesn't matter. I'll take the classes over again in order to familiarize itself with, with the American use 
of scientific terms and so on, which which I did. Any more questions? Yeah. They, like a lot of people got those tattoos on their arms right here. Yeah. Did you the, know the Romanian or? camps didn't tattoo us? Didn't? No, the Germans did. Romanians didn't. Um, you said that the Gestapo was near you um, when the when you were in that cellar. What stopped them from reaching you? Well, the Gestapo didn't find us in that cellar. It was the two Russians that found us there. Yes, sir. What? What prevented? Oh, what prevented them from coming? They probably uh, never <coughs> made it to uh, to our uh, camp. They must have been, been gotten exterminated by the Russians, or they uh, they had to flee across the river pretty fast before they got caught. So we managed to luck out, and in our camp, the the uh, German Gestapo did not come through our camp. We thought they would, but they didn't. We heard though that the camp. The Ju camp of Jurim, which was 50 miles north of there, they surrounded the camp and uh, told everybody to come out. And as he came out of the building, they <coughs> machine gunned them down. So people didn't dare to come out of the building, so they set all the buildings on fire. So the people there either died in the burning buildings or they were all shot. There was the next camp over. We heard that story a few days later. Yes, ma'am. Why do you think the Germans hated the Jews so much? Well, nobody's ever had a satisfactory answer for it. You can say that uh, you dislike a minority if they become a burden to the state. Every taxpayer has to contribute to support those people. You dislike a minority if they are crime-ridden, if they uh, political agitators against the government. Jews didn't do that. They were totally integrated into society, professionally, commercially. They never took any welfare. The Jewish community so supported them themselves very nicely. There was absolutely no earthly reasons why the Germans were Anti-Semitism was deeply ingrained in the European population and to some extent the American population for hundreds of years. And the church, I'm sorry to say, the church didn't help. They made a lot of propaganda against the Jews and were full support of all the Jews to be killed. Uh, um, yeah. Do you think it was simply a religion? Uh, well, religious aspect was certainly one that goes back for hundreds of years. Economic jealousy may have been another one. The Jews, most Jews were well situated. They were all studying hard, they were professors, they were lawyers, they were doctors, they lived in nice middle class homes, they had maids, and many of the Germans didn't have that. So whenever something came up, whose fault is it that we are poor? The Jews. And you know, and you can't defend yourself against it, particularly since the, the Chancellor of Germany, Adolf Hitler, supported that. How did you meet your wife? The one I'm married to now, she's a girl from Arkansas. <laughs> <laughs> Her husband died in a heart attack when he was 50. We met a couple of years after that. I had a first wife, we divorced, and I found Eleanor. Maybe someday you'll meet her. Mm -hmm. And uh, then she wanted to move back to Arkansas because her family lives in this house. That's one of the reasons we came back here. And we met in uh, California. Mm -hmm. We had uh, close friends that were Indians. And uh, the uh, Indian friend that I have who had an office next to mine at Stanford, uh, we became very good friends and we played chess daily. And uh, he invited me over to his house one day. And uh, for dinner, I was already separated from my other wife. And uh, when I came in, his wife said, uh, oh, we have another woman come here to join us, a friend of, of, of his wife's. OK. Which was a charming woman. <laughs> and then I was told, well, uh, uh, if you, I was told that if you call her for a date, she'll accept it. <laughs> so I called her for a date, and we indeed went out. 
and uh, it was, uh, we went out to the theater, we had nice dinner, and I asked her whether I can see her next week again. She was charming and bright and sparkling. So uh, next weekend, we said, do we really have to wait till next Saturday? How about seeing you on Wednesday? Yes. So we met on Wednesday. On Wednesday, we said, do we really have to wait till Saturday? How about tomorrow? <laughs> and pretty soon, we met every single day. <laughs> and close to a year after that, we got married. Uh, yes. Um, have you ever heard of a Mein Kampf? Like, like, in, in yes, a, I have. I've read it. Yeah. Um, do, do, do you, I, mean, cause my, I think my mom has always said that it's probably Adolf Hitler's idea that you know, that started something. Because cause, 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 uh, Adolf Hitler, I don't know if you heard the story, he, he blamed the Jews because cause he, cause he, cause he was not allowed in art school. And that I think, and 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 I think that's you know I think my mom told me that I think that's how it all started with this with this guy. It was, that, you know, it was his idea. It wasn't. It wasn't. I don't think it was a German part. I think it was a Adolf Hitler himself. I don't think it was anything else. I, I think I think the Nazis were basically following his orders. I don't think they really agree with him until they probably paid him. I guess. Oh, the propaganda. You know. Yeah. Well, he had the power of propaganda. Uh, it turns out, uh, if you look into Hitler's uh, biography, Hitler's grandmother was a uh, maid in, uh, in a rich man's family in uh, Austria. And that rich family that she was a maid that was Jewish. And it was customary in those days, not customary, but very often, that the uh, man of the house had a little go around with a mate. Well, they did, and uh, she had a child which became uh, Hitler's mother or father. When Hitler uh, found out that his grandfather was Jewish and that uh, his uh, mother was taking, grandmother was taking advantage of blah, 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 that sparked the beginning of his hatred. Next thing that happened is uh, Hitler thought he could paint. He thought he could. And he came to Vienna and presented his uh, portfolio to the school uh, of uh, to the art school in Vienna. It turns out that, that many of the professors at that art school were Jews, and uh, they had nothing. They didn't know anything about Hitler, but his portfolio was probably very poor. And they did not accept him as a student into that academy. That fueled his hatred some more. That's part of the psychological reasons why he turned so terribly and so many. Yes? Had you ever seen Hitler personally at any of the camps you were in? No, I'd seen in 1937, I once went to Berlin with my parents, and we drove by Hitler's palace in the middle of town. I remember seeing it. I've never seen him personally, but I sure heard him every day ranting and raving on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> what did you think when you... Well, you know, as a uh, seven, eight-year-old kid, nine-year-old kid, I was not able to really analyze it. And here, since you're all here, I would like to make a point to all of you. History has a way of repeating itself. Thank you for saying that. Because we forget what happened 100 years ago. And we fall into the same trap. Fortunately, we have sufficiently good educational systems today and with sufficiently good communication where if we are well educated and we learn how to think rationally, we can analyze the situation we find ourselves in. And when we go to the voting booth, we know what we vote for and what we vote against. It is up to you, young people in the future, not me anymore, up to you to be sufficiently clear-minded and rational to safeguard our liberty for all of us. Rational thinking comes, I had a professor in, in high school in Europe, <coughs> Professor Bernstein, who said, Studying mathematics and studying Latin teaches you how to think. Well, Latin isn't very popular anymore, but mathematics is. 
and I highly, highly encourage you to take your studies very seriously. The teachers that you have give their hearts and their souls to make you into thinking, mature, good Americans. And I might highly recommend that what I have said, I don't know whether it's true for this class, that most of the students do a little less texting and a little bit more homework. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if there are no more questions, Sir, uh, and, uh, no, okay, question. yeah, no. Um, have you seen or noticed throughout your time in America any tendencies um, relative to what happened with Hitler? Have you noticed anything um, like the same occurring in America or that could? You know, That's a very good I knew there was anti-Semitism, in particular in the South. Ever, anybody ever seen the film Gentleman's Agreement with Gregory Peck, an old film? If you can, if you can get it, uh, uh, look at it, being an old film. Uh, yes, there was anti-Semitism. Jews were not allowed to be in country clubs and so on and so on. That doesn't exist anymore. I personally have never encountered anybody in the United States who called me a dirty Jew or made any uncomplimentary remarks about the culture I came from. Uh, America really has grown up, particularly in the last 50 years. We have more to go, but I think we are at an okay point right now. Any more questions? Uh, do yeah. you know any English prior to coming here? When I came here? Yeah. No, not a word. I spoke fluent German and fluent French, but not English. I had to learn that here. Is there any way I can get you to say something in German? <laughs> say something in German? Ach, du lieber Gott. Wie geht es euch allen? Now what did you say? <laughs> oh, my dear God. And then I said, how are you all doing? <laughs> <laughs> well, if there are no more questions, I thank you for listening to me. We thank you. Thank you, thank you very much.